Hi everyone, welcome to The First Customer. My name is Jay Agner. Today I'm lucky enough to be joined by the fantastic uh, Chelsea. Uh, you uh, are called the Rhino uh, on my notes for, for uh, <laughs> and you also started a really cool program which we'll get to and I probably should have put that in our meeting notes. How are you? Very nice to see you. I'm very excited to be here and I love, I saw the, the uh, notes come through with the invite the Rhino <laughs> and that was just like so beyond perfect. <laughs> Well, you run Rhino Reviews, um, which is a very cool company um, that you know I will probably end up engaging with uh, sooner than later. Um, so tell me a little bit about you. Uh, I know you live in Philly now. Um, you know, where'd you come from? Where'd you go to school? Uh, and where'd the story of Chelsea start? <laughs> March 25th, 91. Love uh, that. But yeah, no, I'm from uh, Maryland, just outside of DC. I've been making my way up north. I uh, went to school in the University of Delaware, uh, moved to Jersey, and now I'm living in Philadelphia. Wow. I'm um, and so where did you go to school? Um, the University of Delaware. I played basketball there and actually majored in exercise science. I thought I wanted to do physical therapy. And then I have now joined the, the fabulous group of a college graduate who has a degree with nothing that they're doing. <laughs> uh, well, that's perfect for today then, because uh, that was the whole reason I started this podcast, because people, I think, feel stuck in whatever vein they're in and... Uh, I'm an example of not necessarily being stuck in that vein and figuring out a way out of it. And I think it sounds like you are too. Um, was Rhino the first business you tried to run? It actually was. Um, with the caveat being, I was trying a couple things at once um, to see kind of what stuck. Um, I was in a unique position where I had actually resigned from my job and had a, a little bit of free time. I originally thought I was gonna, going to get my MBA. So I took a couple months off in between and was just playing around, um, seeing if anything stuck. And I started a different version of Rhino Reviews that, that kind of pivoted into what it is now. Um, but at the same time as that was trying to figure out what other service offerings were complementary or just that I noticed a need in the same way Rhino with reviews. And so um, I clearly love alliterations as a Chelsea Craig. You've got Rhino Reviews, RR, and I also heavily kind of leaned into, I called it Chelsea Comments for a little bit. It was about four and a half years ago. And I mean, Instagram is insane now, but social was really just like, becoming a huge thing for influencers. So I was reaching out to influencers and just helping them manage their profiles, not from a content creation, but just the like commenting back, engaging and watching things, which ended up being a subset of a service for Rhino. Um, right. It was a separate business in the beginning. So what was the problem you were trying to solve with Rhino? Yeah, great question. Um, and that's actually one of the things I don't think I really understood enough when I launched it and what led to kind of the pivot about a year in. I was originally um, just trying to help small businesses be protected from online reviews, hence the, the name Rhino. Um, the Rhino is actually known as the Defender of the Week in the Safari. And so I was trying to help small businesses against sometimes the chaos that ensues on Yelp or Google with like disgruntled customers um, for these small business owners that really just didn't have the time or the knowledge on how to handle it. Um, and they were kind of getting abused and sometimes even just straight up blackmail online. So what was the what was the catalyst for that? Was there something that drove you towards kind of identifying that? Yeah, great question. Um, so both my dad and my now fiance are small business owners. And weirdly enough, in about a one month period, both of them had severe issues with online reviews and exactly what I'm talking about. Um, my dad's company is based in Virginia. They're locally based. Um, they work only with local businesses. And um, they got, you know, three or four spam reviews from an IP address that we actually chased back to China. It was a completely fraudulent review, but he had no knowledge or understanding of what it took. And it, you know, it took him a lot more time than it should have to right. resolve it. A lot more hours of his day where his time wasn't well spent. Um, and then same thing with my fiance. He was actually already using a tool to help with it. And I kind of just saw what they were charging him versus what it took me to actually do it. And I thought there was some misalignment there and that's kind of where it all stemmed from. Wow. Wow. Um, it's rare that there's like, I guess I say it's rare. Uh, I had a cybersecurity guy who was trying to buy a car online, his first car, uh, Tyler, and uh, he got hacked from somebody in Ukraine and lost all his money. And then he went and became a cybersecurity Air Force like rock star. So uh, I guess there are some very direct stories that lead uh, to these businesses. Um, so you mentioned that, I, what was the two, so you kind of two competing or two different things kind of running at once. Like what was the thought, like what were you trying to do there? Um, I was kind of throwing everything at a wall and seeing what stuck, if I'm honest. Sure. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fair. I'm a, 
one of the things I'm trying to work on as a business owner and an entrepreneur is thinking a little bit more before doing. I love doing. And because of that, I'm not always the most strategically planned out with things. Um, hence the two businesses at once and should have really focused or doubled down or found a way to connect them, which ended up happening. But um, it was more, you know, when you're running and gunning at the beginning and you know all too well, it's just you're going five miles a minute. Um, mm-hmm. Very, but- very true. Um, so what at what point did it kind of click um, with the right path? Like you had the, you know, a bunch of stuff going and you you know, where was it like, oh, this, and it was it maybe it was working with your dad's, you know, case or whatever. Where, where was the moment you're like, this is something I need to go after full time? Yeah, I was doing a couple other things too. I was on Upwork, um, doing some work there, uh, trying to learn different skills. I took up coding, was doing wireframes. So I was a little kind of all over with things and not, as you just called it, not 150% in on mm-hmm. Rhino, even though that one clearly had the most potential. Um, it really wasn't until... I started, I started working with Sandler sales training because um, Rhino involves some software. Uh, so while that was getting created, I had about a six month lag of just the software development and testing and everything and did Sandler sales training because <laughs> I needed help um, so that when it was launched, I could actually sell something. Sure. And started working with Bob Wax as kind of a business coach. And he basically just called me out and was like, you're saying you believe in this. You say you want it, but you're not giving it your attention. And if you, you're handicapping it and if you really want it to grow, you've got to go all in. Um, that's and- the Shark Tank line, right? That's what, always, <laughs> that's what they always tell people when they're like, oh, you have another job. And they're like, exactly. Oh, it's the red flag like, for them immediately. Yeah. They're, they're like, I'm out. I'm out. Well, what? So you mentioned uh, uh, I have the same problem. I am a doer and an executor. I'm not a great planner or organizer. What have you done? after you kind of identified that you're not the best organizer or not the best strategic planner to start to get that, you know, I'm sure you're still dealing with it if you're anything like me, but what have you done to kind of incrementally improve that? Um, Honestly, getting coaches and people that really force you to stop and sit and think, investing in it the second you tie paying money to something, or at least I'm this way, the second I am paying for something, I want to get the most out of it. So that was a way to really force myself into taking that time to stop and think because if it's up to me and it was just on my own I'll constantly move that to-do list to another day because there's always you know another client to reach out to or a follow-up that needs done um and and the strategic thinking doesn't give me energy it doesn't you know it's not natural for me um and so it really drains me when I do it but I need to do it. Um, so, <laughs> so. Are there any tools or, or methods that you've kind of etched out? Like, do, is there a time of the week or the day that you're you're trying to kind of plan out what's coming? Like, what, how have you gotten a handle on running your business, not day to day and a little more week to week, month to month, year to year? Yeah, um, twofold. So when it comes to times of day, one thing that works for me is like going on a walk and I put on... Um, Shout out Taylor Swift. Uh, I put on Taylor Swift. <laughs> hey, we're going. Are you going? We was uh, my I wife. Know. I will see you there, girl. My yeah, wife. No, my wife so was funny. pounding the keyboard trying to get tickets. <laughs> for your wife, she's got to be thrilled. Oh, she's excited. Oh, she's excited. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, so love Taylor. I uh, listen to it so much that it is now kind of like a white noise effect. So mm-hmm. I go on walks and I, you know, start off listening to a couple songs and then my brain just kind of starts going with things. And I have a notes app that I sit and track things through. Um, is number is how I kind of think through about the business, but what also has allowed me to be able to do that, um, another push from my coach and it was hiring. Um, I am very type A. I probably overestimate the importance of myself in the business and was also handicapping it from that reason because before I, I truly didn't have the time to sit and do that because I was working in the business for right. longer than full days. Um, so, you know, after a 10, 11, 12 hour day of doing client work and sales and marketing, the last thing I want to do is sit and now, okay, think how can we get more or something like that. So really hiring and giving myself back that time, um, but being strategic saying, okay, I've now cleared off, you know, 30 hours of my week. What am I, how am I reinvesting that in the right way? Right. Right. Um, very interesting. Uh, do you use any tool? Like, uh, clearly you do. Uh, what tools do you use internally uh, for whatever ones you want to share? I mean, I use ClickUp and 5 million other tools, but what do you use um, organizationally uh, for, for your tool set? Like what's your, your project management stack? For my team? For, or- yeah, for just in, in general. I mean, for you, for your team, like what do you kind of, what tools do you use on a daily basis to kind of keep your business on track? And maybe that includes your personal stuff as well. 
Yeah, so we're pretty, though I'm in like the tech and uh, software space, quote unquote, like I am, as far as like my generation goes, so far behind the ball on like what I should be able to do online. Um, but so we're very G Suite, like we use Google for everything, Google yeah. Sheets, Google Docs, um, all communications with clients, a lot of our like project work, um, everything is housed there. It's also just nice because then we can all, like everyone can see it at the same points in time. Um, right. I use Asana a lot for like project management. That's where my team okay. has all, all of their kind of like tracking from an accounts perspective, to do stuff like that. Um, I mean, then there's the the actual like business side of things. We use QuickBooks, we use Expandy, we use, you know, like... Out yeah, here. no, these are, these are all great tools. I mean, I, I as you know, I'm a tools dork. So like <laughs> I, I love them and I love to talk about them. And I think I may end up just starting a whole other podcast to talk about uh, niche tools because I love them so much. And you've actually turned me on to a couple of them. I looked at Woodpecker the other day. It seems like uh, looks like something that would be a good fit. And I talked to uh, your buddy Brevin as well. Oh, Shout out to Brevin. Yeah, Brevin's awesome. Um, so, um, so who was your first customer? Who was the first person who paid <laughs> you money for your great idea and what was what had, what did the offer shifted into at that point? Was it something in the mix when you had a bunch of stuff or was it your finalized like this is kind of rhino and this is what we're going to do going forward who was your first customer so i have kind of three if that yep if love, we'll, it. If I, love uh, it yep I go with it. so number one uh like a most well i don't know if this is like most business owners but my like true if you go buy the books on my striped invoicing first customer was my dad um <laughs> I launched it still counts. It still right? counts. It oh, still I remember. Counts. And it was another one of those like moments where I, so we, when I first started the business, we were, um, an e-commerce software. Like, you know, you go online, you purchase it, like you're signing up for QuickBooks, like no interaction, no anything completely check out online and everything. We're a very different business now, but we were selling just a software. And I remember getting like the Stripe notification that like someone just checked out and being so excited thinking, wow, I just launched my website. I just launched this and people are already flooding in. Like I've got uh, it. No, nope, it's my dad. It's my um, dad. Well, they, you know, they have friends and family playing, you know, for a reason, I guess. That's why they do. <laughs> so I appreciated the support there. My, my real, my first real like software customer, um, I started cold calling was my original marketing plan. I would call a hundred, a hundred businesses a day. Oh my and God. That yeah. is, that is after, was, that, was that brutal? After four months, I remember talking to my coach and saying, I don't care what I have to. And it, the problem was it was this, you can understand this as an entrepreneur or as a business owner. Like it was successful. That worked really right. well. And right. so it was hard to sit and say, I don't care how well this works. I can't do it anymore. Right. Um, and so after four months, it was like, I, we got to figure out what what else I need to do um like I don't care what it is we do but like we can't keep doing this but it was hard because it worked so it's hard to step away from that but yeah one of my first calls was that and you want to talk some some crazy cold call stories I can give you those (laughs) (laughs) but uh but yeah it was a cold call and then I would say my real to me who I define as my first real customer is that that pivot that we made so that I could get out of the cold calling um when I first launched the business as I mentioned it was a software I was selling it for $399 a year um it was a a very low end uh I mean the software was good but my pricing was super lean and I didn't actually realize my pricing was losing me customers because it didn't make sense I Mm. thought I'm going to sell this for a third of the price of the competition and everyone's going to jump on it. Well, no one wanted it because they didn't trust, wait, there's a software that you've just built that's a third of the price. Right. Yep. It's not going to work. Um, so my, my coach worked with me on that. We pivoted to a monthly model, um, significantly altered the pricing, offered the ser- altered the services. And my first customer from there actually came from, before I even really had the service kind of nailed out, I was pitching it one day again in that Sandler sales training class and one of the business owners who was in there for his employees who were doing sales training came over and was like, I'll take it. That sounds great. And I went home going, oh my God, I kind of was just blowing smoke. I don't actually have anything here. Right, right. I have to spend the first week <laughs> together. Um, they're still a client four years later. I have such a pl- special place in my heart for them because, I mean, he, I told him, I was like, hey, you, you know, I didn't like actually have any." Right. You gave me the confidence that wow, people would want to buy this. This is something people need. Maybe wow. he's just the best Sandler salesman salesman <laughs> of all time. Maybe he is just now. You're going to tell everybody about Sandler sales because that guy, you'd be like, this is the greatest guy on earth. That's you got to go there. See, so it's maybe that's worth. It's I have definitely referred them because they do. I mean, the support <laughs> is awesome. 
I, I, I think I've heard of it, but I don't know. Uh, what is it? Just kind of sales one hundred and one stuff? Is that? It's is pretty that what much. It is? Yeah. So there's like it's like a twelve week course, either eight or twelve weeks uh, on like all different kind of sales tactics, and it's a little bit more um, aggressive, I would say, than my natural ability. And mm-hmm. but what they do is they teach you so much just about people. I've always thought I got people I can converse where I really struggle is I'm social. I want to talk and have fun. And a lot of people that I'm selling to, they're the owners of companies, their personalities are, I call them high, they're they're called high D's in the the kind of analysis. They're direct, they're to the point, they have 30 seconds, they want to go. Mm -hmm. And it coaches you a lot on also on how to recognize the personality of the person you're talking to and change yourself to match what they need or want to get from the conversation. Um, and then what I really loved about it that to me was the most valuable was once you finish this training, you can go, you, you, on Fridays, they have like a continue ed course kind of mm-hmm. and it's two hours of you just go bring problems. So as I was cold calling, if I would like continue to hear certain objections or, mm-hmm. you know, have questions about something you go and then like other people that have gone through the course talk through it with you. So it's almost like a networking group, but right. for sales focus. Okay. No, that's that's great. I um, I was part of, or I am part of the Pact Group in Philly, which is a fantastic organization, and they were on the call, uh, one of our initial calls, and she was going over this plan that you could do. She's like, it's a mentor program, and you know, you get to all these, you know, advice and these coaches, and I was like, all right, where's the number? She's gonna drop like a here's five thousand dollars to do this thing. This is the big hook, and she's like, it's free. It's part of the membership. I'm like, that's okay. Like, all right. And they interview you, and it's a night, you know, hour long interview. They ask you about your business, ask you about all this stuff, and then they have a list of you know a couple thousand, I think, like really successful entrepreneurs in the Philadelphia area, and they pick you that you they pick the people that they want to mentor. So then you get on a, a call with the five, six, seven people that pick you out of seeing and hearing your information, and you talk to your problems, and like those are I've had two or three of those mentor calls, and they've been some of the most like foundationally shifting calls that I've had just because, like you said, um, that continued kind of, uh, networking, but as part of like, you know, you learn something, but you also be part of the group later on, you kind of keep going and going and going. So it's, it's a great program, um, for anybody that is in the pack group that doesn't do it now or join the pack group if you're not part of the pack. Yeah. I just wrote it down. That sounds great. It's a very, I mean, talk about an awesome group. I just met an astronaut last week. So that was pretty cool. Um, at the pact conference, Scott Kelly was there. Um, yeah, I, uh, it was one of those ask for forgiveness type situations. Like he did his keynote and we were in like the big, you know, uh, Philadelphia Marriott. And I was talking to a lady before and I was like, I really want to meet him. I, I'm like, I'm a dork. Like I take these pictures. Like this is my stuff. Like I, I do this. She's like, yeah, yeah, you can meet him. You can meet him. Um, but he disappeared off the stage and just kind of was leaving. And I'm like standing there across the room. And I look over my COO and I'm like, I'm going for it. And I walked all the way across the thing. I walked behind the curtain. There's like these guys with the computers doing the thing. And I'm like back there. I'm like, I saw him. I walked over. I was just like, I'm the biggest fan, man. Can I please get you know a picture with you? And he's like, oh, yeah, absolutely no problem. And like, and the girl who took the picture, uh, Sarah, who's the marketing director for Pact, uh, used that photo as the thank you photo for Scott Kelly coming to the whole entire conference with my dumb face next to him. I'm like, this is <laughs> this could not have worked out better. Like, I did something I should have done, and I got free press, and I got, you know, a, a great uh, intro to a, a legend. Um, yeah. So just I go for that. it, you know? Just go yeah. for it. Um, you mentioned your walks. Your Taylor Swift walks. Um, I, these are my favorite. This is kind of some of my favorite part of the conversation. What are you doing kind of to keep yourself healthy? Because everybody has different takes on what that is. Everybody says sleep. You know, it's a good one. Uh, mm-hmm. But what, you know, what do you do um, day to day, week to week to kind of keep yourself uh, fit and, and moving forward? Yeah. So uh, walks are one. And, and kind of the, the twofold with that is, I took um, the pen, so really great, another program. Unfortunately, because of COVID, I had to do it online, so I do think I had a different experience with it, but Penn has a um, the program for mindfulness, um, and so it teaches you, it's like an eight-week, um, you get on, and each, each session is a different type of, like, kind of a meditation or mindfulness practice, and the point is to show you, you know, that's, you know, you don't have to sit in the, the cross-legged pose and, and all of that and, you know, chant or whatever, you right. know, find the meditation process or kind of the unplug process that works for you so that when you're in those moments, you can reflect back on that and use it to stay calm. Um, for me, the biggest thing that stuck is, as I mentioned, like, I don't 
like still time. I don't like downtime, which is why I don't enjoy the thinking strategy process. Because in my brain, I go, but I'm not doing anything. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not making progress. So really forcing myself in all areas, not just in the business, you know, thinking about personal life and family and stuff like that in all, you know, taking time to sit and I call it be still time, but just, yeah, like calm for a second, mm -hmm. think about things. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's good for my health too, because it's not good to be just going all the time like a maniac. Right. Um, kind of tying in with that is uh, less coffee. Uh, I drink a lot of, right? It's so hard, especially being at home. Like, I feel like now because I don't, I'm, I'm working from home all the time. My transition in between meetings is I'll go downstairs and I'll get a cup of coffee because it's just a, it's a breakup of something. Um, so bad. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. I, I started to try to like measure it because I never understand. I still don't quite understand how the hell you're supposed to mix coffee properly. Like two spoons per cup and then like cup of what? Like how you put it in the thing yeah. and like, I don't know. So like I tried to, big scoop. right, yeah, like big ass scoop. So I tried to like, I tried to like measure it. And I was like, if I can measure it, then I can figure out how much I have a day. And then I can start to wean myself off and it'll be fine. But what happened was I started drinking way more coffee that was way stronger. And I was just like, I guess this is just my life. This is just, this is just my life now. So that's, that's what it is. What about diet? Are you like on any specific, like, are you anything? You're just kind of straight and narrow. You're whatever. You're, you're, yeah. You're I'm the annoying person with a couple allergies. Okay. Um, so are you peanut, of, you're a peanut girl? I'm no, no. God, okay. No. I was going to say. I was gonna say peanut it. butter, that would hurt my soul. Uh, yeah, that'd be rough. No, like I'm the, the dairy, wheat, gluten, annoying okay. one. Um, okay. But being at, like, I love running. I live right by the Schuylkill, so running on yeah. the Schuylkill is good. Um, tying in with that a little bit is also just like stepping away. You know, we're four years in business now. You know, at the beginning, it, you are. It's a grind 24-7. You're hustling it out because you have to and you want to. Yep. And because I really built my business during COVID, um, so there was truly nothing else going on. I was working all weekend, every evening, like stuff like that. And it was great from a growth perspective. But when the world both opened back up, I realized I had trained clients badly. Um, and I had taught people that you can call me at 1030 on a Saturday morning and I'll pick up and be online and ready to help and whatever you need, which it was great from a client retention and relationship standpoint. But like, in all honesty, it didn't need to be, doesn't need to be handled at 1030 right. morning on a Saturday. So I'm really also trying to not respond to emails on like off business times. I still monitor, you know, you're on your phone. Like I see everything coming through. So if it needs a response, I will, but I'm trying to hold like anything that doesn't actually need a response, like respond tomorrow morning when it's the right time. Right. Um, I would okay. love to say I could do the Tim Ferriss thing. <laughs> it's like the morning and the night. And like, I've tried to do it. And like when my daughter was born, uh, I got just about everybody in my company prepped. And uh, I was like, I'm not going to be around. Like you guys got to kind of figure it out. And um, I quite literally last week replied to an email from June. So um, I did let it get backed up for a while, but uh, I was. What was, I was the line that you put on it? Like, hey, sorry, just. I know. was like, I was like, you won't believe this. You <laughs> won't believe that I didn't see this until now. But I, your son's Eagle Scout thing. I promise, if it's still going on, I swear to God, this was for, this was for my for my accountant's son's thing. I was like, I, I was like, I'm, I definitely do it still. Like, but uh, he's probably grown up now. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I I I fight that all the time, and I try to like not be in there too much. Um, yeah. I have some VAs now, which actually help a lot that kind of um, help just tangentially keep things like, you know, they'll see an email and be like, Hey, did you make sure you check this? And I like to do, do you inbox zero? Are you, are you a zero? Yeah. Zero. So if something's in my inbox, it's because I have to do it. Right. Um, yeah. And what do you do with the ones that you can't do or you don't want to deal with today? Do you snooze them? Nope, there's, they stay in the inbox. They stay in the inbox until you deal with them. That's so every time I open it, it's like a little heart attack. It's like, ooh, still there. <laughs> that's a strong. That's a strong message to yourself. How many hours? So if you paired it back, uh, how many hours a week? Uh, I know, you, don't, you know, your clients won't hear this, but uh, generally, what do you? How, how many hours are you working a week now? Um, right now it's a little bit calmer. Um, I would say it's like twenty-five to thirty. However, I am putting different marketing tactics into place and actually just had a, a conversation yesterday about how many you know the question everyone wants to get like how many um, hours could you dedicate to getting on sales calls I'm exploring um, working with a different company who's going to hopefully help with that um, but needed to like realistically say like okay what am I willing to give you from my time um, of all of this so it'll assuming everything goes well it'll scale back up again um, right. and I'm excited for that I think it's 
I needed a little a little break to get re-energized. We're kind of exploring a lot of different marketing tactics right now. Um, so I guess that would be, that's a, you know what? I already answered the question the wrong way. I am actively working at my desk doing client work, the 25 to 30. That's not including my like thinking, strategizing, coaching calls, like brain, brain work. Mm-hmm. So you're, so you still haven't scaled quite back as far as you, you would like to yet. Yeah, but it's, I mean, you know, when it's your business, like you're never, even when I'm watching TV, I'm sitting, you, you think about something or you hear something like it's never, you don't get that. Oh, it's five o'clock. I get a clock out and I'm home. Um, I'll tell you that it does. It does go away if you spend too, too long away from it. And then, then you go, oh my God, what am I like? What am I like? I'm missing this thing very much. I got to a point where, you know, everything was running itself. Like, yeah. every you know, sales calls were happening without me. Marketing stuff was happening without me. Operations, delivery, execution, finance, like everything was happening. So, it was enjoyable, but you know, terrifying at the same time because even if you're not thinking about the individual pieces of your day-to-day business stuff, if it's all being handled, you're going, is that just going to explode at any second? And it's what you're, that's what you're thinking instead. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's probably, you know, half, half one, six, you know, whatever the phrase is, six in one, half dozen in the other. That's what it is. Um, if you had to start Rhino again today, Ooh. what would you do differently? Other than everything. <laughs> what's the top what's the top give me the top you know top two or three things like what if you were going to go start a business that does what you do today what would be your steps to go start that are you looking to start do any design i may have (laughs) already started it and you may just be validating that uh elephant reviews is going to be the biggest thing in philadelphia (laughs) Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to talk to your people. Yeah, um, I don't think I don't think elephant reviews would go very well. No, but um, so there's a quick piece of advice. What I would say is, um, I, I, uh, I would say white label. Like, bef- uh, try before someone gave me a quote for it that I was talking to the other day about it. And I think it was just like try before you buy or something like that. Okay. Or buy before you build, maybe. So as I mentioned, I was not in this space. I worked at Frito-Lay in sales and I didn't actually even know the term white label existed. I assumed any software or any program that someone had was their proprietary software they had built. So when I decided I wanted to go down this route, I thought, okay, I'm going to sell this software because I think there's opportunities. Mm -hmm. I have to build the software. So I spent, you know, a month teaching myself basic coding so that when I was talking to these software developers, I could understand a little bit of their language. You know, I, I viewed it like if I go to the car dealership and they tell me, ma'am, if you drive another mile, your car is going to blow up. You have to do this. I have no idea. Like I'd be like, okay, yeah, here's my card. I don't want my car to blow up. Right. I was nervous about that with the software. So I taught myself a little bit of coding and then went through about a six, I think it took like six months, a little afterwards with some testing of building the software, not me, but having the, having mm-hmm. them build the software software is expensive. It was a, you know, large lump sum of my savings um, that I was investing into the business. But I I didn't know that there was another option and really fault on me for not, you know, I was talking to a lot of people asking a lot of things, but I was not asking the right questions. Um, and then you're in the space. It's amazing how quickly software becomes obsolete. And, you know, three months later, you have to update it again. And that's another X amount of dollars. Um, so if there's an opportunity, if someone already has it, you know, you're not, re- no one's really reinventing the wheel with anything here. So yep. figure out a way to use what's already out there and enhance it and make it better um, is the quick answer. The other one is just talking to customers. Again, I was, uh, so I, there were about two weeks where I wanted to talk to businesses. I was trying to understand pricing strategy and everything. And so I would go to Wegmans and buy a bunch of taffy and go into like walk up and down the streets. That sounds interesting. Uh, but walk literally just walk into businesses and I would be like, hey, I have got him like the person with the white van and cookies right now is wow. all that's going through my head. Because <laughs> I would walk into businesses and I would literally like pull out a bag filled with taffy and be like, hey, can I talk to you for 30 minutes and ask you some questions? Like I've got candy. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and it worked? Like, it worked. Uh, I mean, it was probably like a 50% success rate. I think people were also just like... I mean, that's... I would think like a like a 1%. I would... Like almost a 0%. Like people see you walking with a bag and they're like, mm-mm. Like oh, no, I had like this messenger <laughs> bag. I had my iPad. I wore like a plain white polo. I was trying to look so official. I think oh. they were really just honestly so confused with me. Oh. Um, but I would talk to them and like, hey, do you care about your reviews? Are you looking online at them at all? But looking back... I realized I based my business off of people that weren't using the tools, that didn't have the tools, that weren't searching for them, and was trying to convince them that they needed this. Instead, I should have interviewed customers of the competitors that I was going after and said, why are you using them? What caused Mm -hmm. you to go there? What don't you like about their service? Because I think I would have gotten to... I mean, the reason we pivoted and launched was because people didn't want another software. They wanted the service. Right. Right. And had I talked to those customers earlier, I think I would have gotten there faster. That's very interesting. And were they ran- the, the people you were sampling were random people, or like, or kind of target? They were, or they just any business you would kind of hit on the street. Truly, like, came to Philadelphia, would park at a cross section, and then just dude. That is, you were like an incredible person. <laughs> like that is like, I don't know if I've talked to him, but it's like just straight up ran through the walls that are in front of him. That's pretty. I mean, that's like the cold calling thing. And that um, are very impressive. Like that's a very, those are two very impressive things to like have gone after. Also uh, two things you said during that Frito-Lay, I want to talk about it. I know you sold yeah. Doritos. And uh, the thing about improving things that already exist, I f- have known in my head a long time that that's something that I enjoy and that I feel like I'm decent at it's like taking something that exists and then improving upon it and i always thought that there was something wrong with that because i always thought like the creative part was the the cool important part but then like later i realized like no everything is like 15 iterations off of something that was made 500 times so it's like once you embrace the fact like yeah you should be looking for things that you can slice off from something else and make its own thing that's better you should look at you know you should go after these things that like you you probably didn't think you should go after before you have that experience. But uh, tell me about Frito-Lay. You were sales. So you did, you did do sales. That's interesting. So maybe cold calling wasn't completely foreign to you, right? Or did you do, how did you do sales with Frito-Lay? Yeah. So I was in sales management. So I had a team okay. um, of about like 12, I managed 12 reps and kind of like coached them on their selling um, and just helped manage that. Um, so there was like, I was comfortable walking into a store going like, Hey, I need to talk. Who, who's the manager here? Hi. I'm he's terrified. That scares the <laughs> shit out of me. Like, I can't I think like, it's you- when you're younger though. Like neither of us are like super old, but I mean, I was 27 when I launched dry now and I had, you know, I started working with free. I worked at Frito for three years. So from I don't know, 22 to 25, I guess I was 26 with Rhino. And like, you don't, it, there is something about like the ignorance. Yeah. I think now, like I'm, I'm, I'm more scared now of like the idea of going back to a cold call, not because I don't want to, because I'm like, Oh, what if they hang up on me? What if they're mean? Like when you're in that, like just go mode, you don't have questions. There's also, I think one of the biggest challenges for me that I caught myself this past year is when you're building a business, like you don't have another option. It's the burn the boat method. Like you, you're on the Island, you've burned the boat. So you've got to make home on that Island and figure out how to make it work. Yep. And when you have nothing to lose, like you're scrappy, you'll do anything. And I realized this past year, I was not making investments because we have grown Rhino to a place where I'm very like, you know, we're not Amazon, but like, I'm I'm proud of where we've grown. I realized I've gotten scared of doing things because I'm like, what if it doesn't work? And like, what if it gets worse? Or what if we lose this? And Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you, I'm approaching it differently versus that just like, scrappy startup mode. Um, right. It's you know it's interesting though and I love that point because I have some really high uh motor people in like my strategy space and my operation space and whatever. And what I kind of realized somewhat recently is they have that fire for those individual things, yeah. but but to get an initiative moving, I'm needed. Like that's my goal. Like my 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 role in this is to orchestrate a line and let good people do good things. And that's it. Like there's nothing else. There's no, there's no magic to it. It's like find the right people that do the right things that you need them to. But on the flip side of that, um, you can't expect people to go off and 
make some initiative happen for your company. You can't farm out like that, like, like optics and like, you know, growth. I mean, you can, to some degree, yes, you can get partners and tools and whatever, but you have to be a catalyst for that stuff. You are at the end of the day, the only person that gives a shit, whether your business survives or doesn't like nobody else cares other than getting a paycheck. Nobody cares. It's just like stock tips. I always say, if you're going to take a stock tip, you better be at that guy's house the next day and he better be paying your bills when you, you know, you lose all your money and he's not going to be right. So like, yeah. I don't, it's a, I treat, I treat my business the same way. I don't put my eggs in anybody else's basket. And if things aren't moving, it's very easy to just go, why aren't everybody, what's going on? Like, why are this guy got all these people? Like 50 people, like, what are you guys doing? Like, and it's, but then you go, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm the one who's feeding all of it. Like you, you have to feed it with energy and you have to feed it with vision and you have to feed it with strategy. And like, that's kind of, I think what our role is. Um, less in the day to day, you know, having to be there to get the things done with the initial, the initial like legs of the initiatives, but kicking off those big initiatives can't come from anywhere else. Unless, I mean, I guess, unless you have some like really strong, like a, like almost like a co, you know, CEO level, like person that's driving stuff forward with you. Mm-hmm. Or like if you're CEO, like you really like handle everything, in t- everything in tandem. I, it, but even so, like my CEO, uh, I've started to realize like she is my, like the best COO on earth, but like um, I'm wasting her time, including her on things that, you know, maybe they're marketing related. And like, since she's my COO, I'm like, well, she should know about it and whatever. And then I'm like, and of course I keep everybody in the loop about stuff, but like, that's not where she's crushing it. So like, that's where she should be focused. And I should be talking to her about that sort of stuff. And it's marketing initiative stuff with the really smart marketing folks. Um, so it's using people to their strengths and kind of figuring out what the hell to do with the group of people that you've assembled. How many people are working with you now? Like mm-hmm. subcontractors, whatever else. Yeah. So I have a team of four. Um, they're awesome. All females. Uh, so, my whole executive team is females, by the way. Yeah. Every, every one of them. Every one of them. <laughs> and all my VAs are all, I, I think all my, basically most of my employees are females. Yeah. Girl power. <laughs> very organized. Uh, very to the point. Um, yeah, it's weird. I don't, I've never... I don't know why. I, I it's been that way. Oh, Autumn's fantastic. I you've met Autumn. She's she's like yeah. the yeah. absolute uh, rock star. She just she's just. It was four years. She's oh, been wow. with me like the 29th of November. So she's been. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, even before like the company was really anything. Um, she kind of you know she was working with me as a subcontractor, and then just kind of like everybody goes. How do you get an amazing operations person that knows everything about what you do? I'm like, well, you don't hire one that's an operations person. You hire one that's like that does what you do and like understands it. And then like they grow out to, you know, pull in all the pieces that you've been doing. Uh, and that's what I'm talking to Alex about now, actually, is like trying to get him. He wants an ops person. I'm like, let's let's talk through like all the things you do on a daily basis before you try to just kind of like hand it off and hope they can do, you know, yeah. uh, uh, what you do. But um so, uh, mystery question for you. Oh, okay. This is one of my favorites. It's not a mystery if anybody's listening to the podcast, but nobody does, so it's always a mystery. Um, if uh, if you could do anything on Earth Ooh. and knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? Oh, wow. Take a, take a couple seconds. It's fine. It's, a, it's one that makes you think a little bit, but I do love the... It does, yeah. Well, there's like so many different ways to approach that question. I feel like I, my personality is going to get judged. Like my my brain, this is going to sound weird. Like my like gut wrench reaction, like that just immediately popped in the second you said that, was like win some Olympic sport. But then in reality, like that's not like that. But that, there's something about that's attractive to you. Um, yeah, I think that's cool. Then I went. I'd buy a lottery ticket. Like obviously, if I knew I couldn't fail, I'd want to win the lottery. And I thought that's really selfish and thought, you know, I'd solve homelessness or something like that, be the next Amazon. Well, if I was asking you in front of a... Like, oh, gosh. If I asked in front of a group of people, uh, you know, you'd be judged. But like I said, nobody's going to hear this. (laughs) It's just us talking. Um, Yeah, my favorite... uh, That's I I don't even... I I asked that question and I'm not sure. Um, You know what I would do? I would go to space. If I could be an astronaut, I would do that. You said on Earth. That's fair. Well, you're start on Earth. You know, you gotta. You know, it's a big. It's a big thing. Um, my uh, cousin said, climb Mount climb Mount Everest, which I thought was Ooh. a really. That's a that's a solid one. That um, is good. I mean, there's some. You know, there's a ton. Like you said, like it depends. It's a great question because it could mean yeah. a bunch of different things. It's like I think Chris uh, Sarah said something about solving the education problem because of course he's the greatest human being to ever live. So he would say something like that. How do I want to answer this? Yeah. So that- 
I, I'm like, I'm oh, like, I would like to, I would like to dive into a pool of money like Scrooge McDuck. Like that's mine. So I mean, if if you guys want to solve cancer, that's fine. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do me. Uh, um, well, Chelsea, you've been fantastic. I think we're good. We've got everything. I would love to have you on uh, a million times. Uh, uh, Rhino reviews, Rhino Dash reviews dot com, right? Yeah, it's true. Rhino Dash reviews dot com. Chelsea Craig, uh, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me today, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you for having me on. This is a pleasure. Thanks, Chelsea. See ya.